Good afternoon and welcome. Here we are again with another EEAP presentation. I'm Rick Roman. And Michael Crawley. Today's topic is going to be heat illness prevention and how it's being applied to general industry. We are going to have an, uh, questions and answers at the end, so if you have any along the way, feel free to type them into the chat box on the upper right of your screen, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. So some of the things that we're going to be discussing today is the origin of the heat illness prevention program, how it's been redefined, the triggers for implementing heat illness prevention procedures, the required provisions, risk factors for heat illness, and signs to look for. So in June of 2005, California adopted the code which pertains to the heat illness prevention program. It was mainly brought about due to the rash of heat related deaths that were happening primarily in the agricultural industry and it basically requires all employers with outdoor work sites to take four basic steps to prevent heat illness. Those steps are, and we'll get a little bit more into those as we get down the road here, but our training for your supervisors and employees about heat illness prevention, providing water and encouraging them to drink it, uh, having access to shade so that they can take rest and recovery periods, and having a plan, in other words, uh, a written heat illness prevention program uh, which lays out how you're going to comply with the regulations. If any of these four elements are not present at a work site, when the temperature hits 85 degrees, employers risk a serious violation by Cal OSHA. Now in 2010, um, November, Cal OSHA amended the Heat Illness Prevention Code. The first major change was the addition of the high heat procedures. Those are to be implemented when the temperatures equal or exceed 95 degrees. These only apply to agriculture, construction, landscaping, oil and gas extraction, transportation and delivery of agricultural products, construction, or other heavy materials. Now those high heat procedures are first ensuring that an effective communication by voice, observation, or electronic means is maintained so that employees at the work site can contact a supervisor when necessary. Now this is actually something that you should have in place because heat illness is really only one of many types of injuries or illnesses that can occur on your job site. So as part of your emergency action plan, you should already have something in place so that in the event of an emergency, that supervisors or emergency services can be contacted. The second step is observing employees for alertness and signs and symptoms of heat illness reminding employees throughout the work shift to drink plenty of water. So as you can see, they're not really different regulations. They're more, it's a more vigilant effort in, in applying the regulations that already exist. Um, also, there's close supervision of a new employee by a supervisor or a designee for the first 14 days of the employee's employment by the employer. Unless the employee indicates at the time of hire that he or she has been doing similar outdoor work for at least 10 of the past 30 days for four more hours per day. Um, Michael, what, what's your recommendation on that? Because that seems a little quirky there, that unless the employee tells you that they've been working. Well, you know, the, that is the spot that as we were putting this together that we wanted to make clear to you guys. The reality of it is this. No matter what that employee tells you, that, that he's good to go, he, he understands what he's been doing, he's been doing this job for years, you got to just assume that he hasn't. Our recommendation is that you just assume that he has it and you just watch him. Th that third, that fourth point to the screen that Rick's reading there is you just watch him for the 14 days. Just watch him for the 14 days and make sure he acclimatizes. And Rick's going to talk a little bit more about uh, about a couple other things that will help you understand uh, this a little bit deeper. But yeah, you really got to watch him. Really got to watch him. And, and studies show that about 80% of heat-related illnesses actually occur during the employee's first four days of employment. So it's really critical that you're watching them at that time. 
The other important piece that, that came about in, in that, uh, that uh, revisement is that Cal OSHA clarified what DOSH refers to as an outdoor workplace. So they basically laid out here what they consider an outdoor workplace. This part's a little bit wordy, uh, but we want you to understand exactly, and, and we have the link of, of where this came from, from Cal OSHA. This is exactly as it is written, and, uh, and I'm also going to have Mike is going to chime in here with some practical application of what's going on and what he's seeing in the Cal OSHA system. So here we go. An outdoor place of employment is best thought of as one that is not an indoor workplace. Sounds obvious enough. A workplace with a roof and enclosed sides is generally considered an indoor workplace. For the purpose of this standard, the important quality of the majority of indoor workplaces is that they reduce the risk factors that commonly lead to heat illness. For example, building codes require that buildings provide sufficient ventilation either by natural or mechanical means, indoor workplaces usually also block exposure to direct sunlight. So when you're thinking about your work environment, and remember the title of this, this webinar is going to be not just for contractors and farmers. A lot of times when in the beginning of this webinar Rick was talking about the, the basic industries that this is going to affect agriculture construction, but we've chosen a couple pictures here that are interesting. Obviously foundries are going to be very hot inside, but if you're talking about a warehouse or some sort of factory that you've got, you can see the bottom picture there is where it gets a little gray. You can see that they're indoors, the picture is being taken from an indoor area, but they have a yard in the back where employees go and work. That is what we're going to get into depth about, and that's where you are going to be possibly dragged into, because even though you do have a building with, with maybe air conditioning or vents, do your employees work outside? Or is there workplaces outside that they could be have heat stress from? And that's really where this could very well apply to you. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about that. Okay. So as we continue on, it says, on the other hand, open areas like agricultural fields, forest, parks, equipment and storage yards, outdoor utility installations, Tarmacs and roads are obvious examples of outdoor workplaces. Outdoor workplaces also include construction site in which no building shell has been completed and areas of construction sites that are outside of any building shells that may be present. Outdoor areas adjacent to buildings, examples, loading docks are also considered to be outdoor workplaces of employment if an employee spends a significant amount of time working in them. Now this key spot to the end of that is the words that he's talked about about outdoor areas adjacent to buildings and this is where it's going to get. So you'll see two pictures we've got once again. That's a beautiful warehouse there. It seems like it's got a lot going on but they've got loading docks and guys are working out underneath the lean twos or the loading docks or, or, or the areas outside. Thus that company would have to have a heat illness program and could be violated be visited by Cal OSHA and Cal OSHA fines put against them because they don't have a heat illness because their people work outside. So are your guys driving forklifts outside in your yard? Are they going out there? Are they managing things out there? The heat stress out there is exactly what this is talking about. Okay, as we conclude uh, this segment on there, it says sheds, packing sheds, and partial or temporary structures such as tents, lean-tos, and structures with one or more open sides can be either indoor or outdoor workplaces depending on the circumstances. In the top picture you'll be able to see that this is a lean-to. So if you're a welding shop or you're doing some sort of assembly outside under a cover or a lean-to, this is why Rick titled this webinar perfectly. It's not just for contractors and farmers anymore. You, the, the code has been put in a way where if you've got a shop and you've got a little bit of workspace, which I know a lot of our clients do and those that aren't our clients you might have a space like that. You, you, you might not be doing welding but you are doing some sort of fabrication, painting, outdoor maintenance, pallet cutting, forming, whatever, this is where you've got to have heat illness and training put in place that are talked about all in that, in that kind of a system. In many cases, these structures may actually be hotter than the environment outside of them because heating by the sun and conditions inside, like limited air circulation or lack of insulation. DOSH considers a structure in this category to be an outdoor workplace if it does not significantly reduce 
the net effect of the environmental risk factors that exist immediately outside the structure. Rick has done a great job of putting this together and, and helping you understand exactly what the Cal OSHA reads off the Cal OSHA website that you see at the bottom. That is a link to that. This is word for word and so I'll just reiterate what he's saying. Uh, that, that DOSH considers a structure in this category to be an outdoor workplace. And that's where this gets to be a little dicey with companies saying, nope, that's under the construction guidelines or, or that, that code isn't for us. They are able to connect certain codes to businesses even though they might be under agricultural and you might be a manufacturer. Just because it's not under one of the sections that applies to you or is labeled for your industry doesn't mean they can't cite you. There have been DARS, which are a decision after reconsideration that comes from the appeals board that states that if there is a code or a law that is logically applicable, uh, applicable to another industry, that that industry should be held to that standard, which the crazy part about that is you now not, you don't, you just don't run ma read manufacturing guidelines when you are a manufacturer. You have to know all the guidelines in every industry to make sure there's nothing that can apply to you or, or how this is put together. So this can be a very difficult thing. Okay, let's take a look again at what the implementation triggers are for making sure that you have the procedures in place. 85 degrees is the temperature at which Cal OSHA will cite a company who does not have and implement a heat illness prevention program. And 95 degrees is the temperature at which the high heat procedures must be implemented. So there's certain things that the employee or employer I should say is required to provide for its employees. So the first one here is access to water. At least one quart per employee per hour for the entire shift. You have to provide cool, clean drinking water and you have to provide them with cups and encourage your employees to drink that. Now if you're at one of the facilities that we're talking to and you got a lean-to on the outside, you're a manufacturer or you, you have a warehouse of some kind, you can use drinking fountains. You don't have to provide the cups because those are drinking fountains. You can do that. But if your drinking fountain uh, is something that your, your own mother wouldn't drink out of, then you got a problem. Some, some of them can get very dirty and gross out there and you just got to keep focused on keeping that clean. If not, you got to figure out a system to do that. In addition, if you are in a uh, warehouse type of uh, structure, you have to make sure that the employees, even though you're probably plumb there, that they have a place that they can get that drinking water from and a sink in a bathroom is not something that Cal OSHA is going to accept. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I would have, yeah. You, you don't want water out of a, drinking water out of the bathroom is not a good choice, Rick. I concur with you, my friend. Okay. So then the, the next option here is, is that you also have to provide access to shade. So obviously if you're in, in a manufacturing facility, again, access to shade is not a problem. If your guys are outside, then you need to provide, when that temperature hits 85 degrees, you need to erect enough shade. If there's not natural shade, but a tree was sufficient. Uh, if Otherwise, you need to erect enough shade to accommodate at least 25% of the workforce at one time, but you have to make sure that you have on site adequate shade available that you can provide it for any and all employees that request it. Now one of the things that people ask me on a job site or construction or places where you don't have that building like the warehouses and the manufacturers and the foundries, they'll say, well what if the employee has their vehicle? That's shade, the AC works. But here's the key to the law that, that is going to be held, upheld in the court. The employer must provide provide. You're not providing them with their car. So it's got to be something you provide and you can maintain. If the employee's driving, no offense, a bucket of a car to work and it won't start or the air conditioning doesn't work, that's nothing that you provide. And so remember, shade is something you provide, not something the employee brings with them and that is theirs. Okay, and then the next step is weather monitoring. We have crazy weather out here in California. It might be 72 degrees all week long. Next thing you know, it's 85, 88 degrees just a couple days later. So it is the employer's responsibility to have somebody who is checking weather forecasts. 
monitoring the temperature throughout the day. You might be starting work at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning when it's still relatively cool, but by 10 or 11 o'clock as that temperature is rising, you need to be able to know when that you need to get the shade erected and, and to get that water that's available for your employees. Obviously, you have to have the heat illness prevention program. Now, if you're a client of EEAP, uh, you've already got that, that program written as part of your safety programs. We write that for all of our clients. Um, but if you're not, then that's something that you need to make sure that you have. Uh, you have to provide training for all of your employees and supervisors. Um, we have several lessons that are available for you to choose from that help you to uh, comply with this regulation, but the important thing is, is that you're making sure that supervisors and employees alike are trained in knowing and being able to recognize the signs and symptoms of heat illness, knowing first aid procedures needed to treat the various heat illnesses, and contacting emergency services. Beyond that, your employees should obviously be trained on the frequent consumption of the provided drinking water for them and taking five-minute breaks in a shaded area. Now, on your client login center with the clients that are out there, you, you'll notice that the heat illness, like he said, is on your documentation tab on your client login center. If you don't have it or, or that wasn't put in there, just give us a call, but everybody should have that. And then under the lessons, just type in heat illness, and uh, you'll get two or three lessons that pop up that will meet all the, all the standards and all the requirements so that you can get that training done. If you are somebody who receives our monthly training, then, then we've already been doing that for you. Okay, and then the supervisors uh, need some special training as well. Obviously, tr being trained on how to train the employees to prevent and treat heat illness, providing the water, knowing when and, and creating schedules for re replenishing water. You may not have enough water at the site at one time to provide a court for every employee for every hour of the day that they're going to be there, but you need to replenish that water, not when the bucket's empty, but you need to have something in place for doing that. Also for checking the temperature uh, before and during the shift throughout the day and monitoring that, uh, posting emergency response procedures. And then also you have to provide a acclimatization period. Just as a weightlifter would not go straight to lifting 400 pounds or a long distance runner would not enter into a marathon on his first day of running, your employees need to acclimate to the weather. It takes a, a period of time to get used to that hot weather and, and working up and building their endurance to where they can stay out there for those longer periods of time. You know, it, it, as most of us men, we, 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 we think we can be strong and we can do everything and we need to be at the level of others around us. And, and the problem you have is you get guys out there trying to really show their stuff to you and they get out there and they'll pass out. They'll, they'll show the symptoms. And so we've got some things that as we go forward, you, we should be able to help your people know the symptoms and be able to point those out to them so they can be safe. So as, as you consider the... the uh, Get, getting climatized and also for the workloads for your employees, there is environmental and personal uh, risk factors that you have to take into account. The air temperature, well that's pretty cut and dry. It's, we already know at 85 degrees you have to have those processes in place. But humidity, uh, it could be less than 85 degrees but when it's humid out it's going to feel a lot warmer than it actually is. Or air movement. I, I rather work outside in 90 degree weather with a breeze than in 83 degree weather in still and stagnant air. Um, and then the severity of the work and the duration, like Mike uh, talked about earlier. Maybe they're in the warehouse uh, for the majority of the day, but they go out in the yard and they do some periodic tasks where they're out there for just a short period of time. But if they're out there for a longer period, that's something you got to consider. Also, the personal protective equipment. That tends to get a little bit heavy and warm, and uh, that's another factor that you got to take into consideration. And as long as with the personal things of age, health, water consumption, consumption of diuretics, the degree of the acclimatization and the use of prescription or non-prescription medications. Now some of the signs and symptoms of heat illness include sunburn and heat rash. 
which are things that you will primarily see when the employees are actually working outdoors and are exposed to the sun. But things like heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke can actually happen working in an indoor facility where they're just in a hot environment. And, and you'll, you'll find that if they're drinking a lot of sodas and energy drinks out there, uh, the, these things will slow, uh, will speed up this heat exhaustion to the point where you know heat stroke comes, and they might not be able to realize it because they're disoriented. They're they're, they're not clear thinking in the head, and so it's not it's not a good idea just to say, well, if you have any heat symptoms, employees, just let us know. Yeah, that's a good way to go about it, but you also got to have that second back and all the things we've talked about in prior to this slide about letting the managers know they've got to be able to spot this stuff so that they can literally call out and say, hey, you don't look so good. You look like you're, 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 you're not doing uh, well. You're, you're getting a little disorganized. Okay, now Michael talked about us being able to provide for you uh, some, some help in, in things to be able to communicate with your employees and we have this poster here that we're providing that uh, encourages your employees to drink, tells them about uh, some of the risk factors and symptoms and uh, a, there's even a urine test uh, chart on there for them to be able to kind of have an idea of what their hydration level is so that they can, so that they can be well in that area. You'll see that this, this urine test is not 100%. Yeah, that's what you're gauging it to. But we've looked at a lot of these, not to get weird, but we've looked at a lot of urine tests to figure out uh, what, what are the color schemes and what happens. And looking at some medical reports, you just want to say that you keep yourself in the gauge of, of, of the top three there to the left. But really, when you're talking about training, you're able to put, print this uh, download that we've given you for free up and uh, put this up in the either the restrooms or the warehouses of where your guys are at. It'll do two things. Obviously, tell them the early symptoms and the life-threatening systems, and it will keep them uh, looking at it so that they can see where they're at and how, they're, how, how well they're doing. But if they are taking vitamins and stuff, it will throw off the chart. We do understand that. But overall, it's not a bad way to see if you're dehydrated. So as we mentioned, if you are a client of EEAP, uh, we've already got we've got all the training lessons that you need uh, to, to do this with your employees. You've got the documentation. Uh, if you're not a client of EEAP, as always, we're happy to come out and do a free consultation and evaluation for you. Take a look at your documentation. Make sure what you have is, is current and, and all that you're required to have and uh, see if we might be of any help for you or to be a reference for down the road. If you have any questions, we'll go ahead and, and start taking questions right now. Uh, I do have a couple already and we'll get started and uh, see if we can help you guys here with these so the first one says, is it against OSHA regulations to wear a rag cap under a hard hat? Good question. No. There is no OSHA regulation that says you can't wear a rag hat under a hard hat. And they make a lot of these that are very appropriate for this cooling down process that they've got that I'm sure you're aware of, and that's why you're asking about it. But if the question was, can I wear a baseball cap? Can I wear something that makes it so the hard hat doesn't sit square in your head? Yeah, yeah, that, could, that very well could be a violation. But uh, just a basic rag, no, sir. Okay, it says... Uh, we transport our employees in a company vehicle. Would that be considered that we provided it to them? I'm, I'm guessing he's talking about using yeah. the car for shade. Yeah, yeah, good question. The answer is yes, but 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 if you you got to be able to provide, literally, that's got to be able to hold all of them. And so if, if the van holds all of them, great. If it doesn't hold all of them, then, you I mean, at least 25%, obviously, then, then you're good to go there. But the problem with the van is this in my mind. It's got stagnant air inside. It is hotter than heck inside. You've got to start the engine and then wait for the air to keep up and to get cool. And so, yes, the van works, but you, it might take you five, ten minutes to get that thing cool because unless you've got a jet engine on an air conditioning in that van, something's telling me your air conditioning in that van is not great. And that might be better just to keep them in the shade outside because that's one of those circumstances where it's hotter inside than it is outside. So you've got to be careful with that. Okay, next question. If the temperature is less than 85 and forecasted to remain so, is there any need for the four steps? 
If the temperature is 85 and forecasted to be so, the answer is yes. It's and below. And below. And this is why. If it's 82, 83, 75, you've got to be ready for the steps. And, and if even at 75, if the gentleman or your workers, male or female, need water, you've got to be able to provide them. Yes, the heat illness thing does not kick in, but the reality is... Here in the summertime, it is, unless you're right down in Santa Barbara where it's a cool 75 all the time, it's just a good thing to make sure your people have water, no matter what. And keep in mind, two of the four steps are having the written safety program, so that's obviously applicable at all times, and providing the training for your employees. So your, your employees have to be ready for it, so you're supposed to be doing that anyway. You already have done two of the four steps. Um, the other two, like Michael said, you just need to be prepared for. Okay, let's see here. Um, we are a manufacturing company that works in a large building that has a, has swamp coolers that are on the roof. The only people that have that work outside are employees who might go on the roof to fix things, do we need to have this program on file? You have, I'm assuming that you have no storage outside. Your guys don't go outside to work or to get loads. I'm going to assume that they're not going out there, but they're just going on top of the roof. If they're going on top of the roof to work up there, the question is how long is the duration of the roof? Overall, yeah, there's not a problem with you have heat illness and doing some training and keeping these things in place. Like Rick said, two of the four steps are just the program and the training. And, and chances are that that's going to be very easy for you to do since you're probably a client of ours already. The second part is you just got to provide them the water and whatnot. So I would say yes, if you guys are going out. My second point I want to say on another note is, my heaven sakes, man, letting them go up on the roof, you got to make sure you have good fall protection. You might want to call us and let us take a look at what you're doing to make sure they're not going to fall through a skylight or whatnot. There might be some other issues not related to this subject that you need to consider. Okay, the next one says, does a straw hat with a wide brim that provides shade comply with the shade regulation? Many of our employees wear these, although we don't supply them. A shaded hat is a great option. But it is not shade. It is, it, is a, it is a large hat. So the answer to your question is no. That does not qualify as shade. A, a large hat does not qualify it as shade. Okay, the next question. Is it acceptable to provide employees with two gallon water jugs and a source to fill them throughout the day? Sure, sure it is. The, the, you got to provide them with cool water, and so you give them two gallon water jugs. They walk into the in, into the into wherever they're at, and after an hour, they're both lukewarm. Congratulations! Now you've got lukewarm water, and that's not a great idea either. So the word word is you got to provide them with cool water, and so those water jugs need to be insulated of some sort, and you, and you might consider some ice of some sort to keep them cool. Now your next question might be, well, how, what is cool? Give me the temperature. There is no temperature, and that's where it's difficult on that side of it. So the word cool will be argumentative by the inspector coming out, but the reality is you, you, you just want to li literally say, all right, it's coolish at the bare minimum. Okay, uh, next question. Is it against OSHA regulations to place a bandana under a facial mask? And then in parentheses, respirator. Yes, yes it is. You, you cannot put a bandana underneath a respirator. Now when you say respirator, the next question is, are we talking about a dust mask or a rubber shield dual cartridge respirator? A dual uh, rubber shield dual cartridge respirator, the answer would be yes. You, you can't put anything. That needs to be fitted directly to the skin and our fit and smell testing that we do for our clients would, would have taught the employee that. If it's a dust mask, well, I don't see the purpose of a rag against his face. Uh, that, that would be, a, a, but no, no, no to the question. How far does the water have to be available for the employees? I'm guessing they're saying, asking how yeah. close do we need to have this to the employees. You have to have it within reason. You're looking for a distance. You're looking for me to say yards or some sort of distance in a half a mile, a quarter mile, or something like that. So I'm not going to give you that, and that's going to frustrate you. It's got to be reasonably close. And, and that reasonably close conversation is one that we should have, depending on your facility. If your guys are farmers, contractors, or whatnot, they've got to be reasonably close. In a, in a five minute conversation to tell me the exact circumstances, I'll be able to tell you that's reasonable, that's not. 
Okay, as of right now, that looks like all the questions that we have, but remember, you will be getting a, uh, a replay uh, email here in the next few hours, and you can watch the webinar again and have the availability to ask questions. Those will come directly to my email through the webinar replay, and of course, you can always contact us here at our offices. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, I do have another one that just popped in here as I am kind of signing out here, but let's see here. Michael, I'm aware that the water needs to be clean, but is there a sanitary check such as PPM that is acceptable? Uh, the water needs to be clean. You don't need to be doing any sort of tests of whatnot, but if you open up your egg loose or whatnot and you've got floaties in it, that's a good test. Uh, if you can drink it, great. If you feel like there's a lot of bleach or chlorine or something weird in it, yeah, don't drink it. You might want to have it trucked in, a sparkled trucker come, come in, but uh, when it comes to the reality of how you check it, we don't need to go too crazy on doing tests and water tests and all that. As a kid, I drank out of a hose that I think the dog peed on several times. So I, I think I'll be fine for work-related. You might not want to go that deep on it, but just give us some cool water with no floaties in it. And I think we're, we're pretty much good. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up now. If, uh, Like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. And uh, thanks again for stopping in and spending a little bit of time with us. Thank you, guys.